Okay, this is the class we are all looking forward to, chapter 12. Talk a little bit about chastisement. Uh, but I'm yeah, sure if you've read the book, read the chapter, you'll see that, well, God is a very gracious God. And he loves his kids. He's a good father. You know that song, you're a good, good father? Well, it's, it's real. It's, he really is a good father. And as the best father, he cares for his children. He wants his children to live righteously. He wants us to walk in the paths he's chosen for us. And uh, from time to time, he does have to step in and bring a little correction. So uh, we're going to look at that tonight. We're also going to look at uh, walking by faith in the early part of the chapter. Now, next week is the midterm exam. Okay, so everyone should have a hard copy of the review. Well, I and, have plus in here. Okay. I mean, it's been sent by email. By email, yep, and it was also an email sent. Did you make that? I'm printing it right now. Okay, so after this class, maybe not even after this class, maybe not after this next class, we'll have the hard copies of the okay. review. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, we did also Thank email, you so you got plenty of opportunity to, to get them. Now... This exam is going to have matching, so you may have on one side of the, the page a Greek word, and then on the left-hand side, you'll have two or three words of definition, and you just have to match the word with the definition. Uh, after that, there are some true and false. Be careful. True and false can be very tricky. Uh, then some fill-in-the-blanks, and then at the end, a few list-type what are the six things Jesus is better than, maybe, and stuff like that. I'll just tell you this. If you study the review, you will do excellent on the exam. There won't be anything on the exam that is not in the review. Okay, so you can look at your notes. That's fine. Uh, the answers are on the review, and if you study them, you'll do very well. Okay, we're not trying to get, we don't want people failing. The whole purpose of exams, in my viewpoint, is to help us call back to remembrance again and again. A little bit of repetition so that we keep it in, in our mind so it, st it stays there. It's not, you know, the, my exams are not so people will fail. I very, you know, you're not going to fail. But I would ask you this. Please write el uh, eligibly, uh, legibly. <laughs> if I cannot read it, I cannot grade you, I cannot give you a good grade on it. Okay, I... I I used to say this to the guys in Albania all the time because English is at least a second language. For most of them, it's the third language. Uh, and I asked them, please, write neatly. I'll give you grace for your answers, but if I can't read it, I can't do anything for you. So please, you may think you write well. Well, maybe you don't. So please. All right, so anyway, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Are these tests something you actually write up, or do you follow? I actually write them up. Oh, okay. So I give that discussion to you, the teacher, to, to ask what questions you want? Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm the one that, yeah, I'm the one that goes. If you look at the tape course guides that you have, the, the questions on the bottom of the pages mm -hmm. are the same questions that are on the review. So if during the course of the course you've been writing down answers as you've heard them, then you're a couple of steps ahead already. But yeah, I put together the exam the best I can. I try not to be too difficult. This is a third year class in Bible college, so it's a little bit more. Anyway. All right, let's get right to the, the class now. Hebrews chapter 12. This, is, this particular chapter has so many things in it. We find with Paul's letters that at the end of the letters, uh, usually the last chapter, he ends up writing a lot of different things. And... You know, like it's like the end of the letter, but he wants, oh, I, oh, I should have said this, oh, I should have said that. And he writes a lot of things. In this particular letter, in chapter 12, we see that. We see a lot of things being spoken of. So we're going to try to go through all of them at least a little bit so that we can uh, see what the author intended. Now, just another, I want to say this again, to remember that this is a book that was written to believing Jews. So it is different than the other books you're going to see in the New Testament. It was you have to look at, at it hermeneutically and look at the context of the book, 
the author, of which we don't know, uh, the audience is very important. The circumstances for writing are very important her hermeneutically when we want to understand what was written. And I say this because many uh, problems have occurred when people misinterpret portions of this particular book. And we've looked at some of them already, chapter 6, chapter 10, people that use a lot of what's in the book of Hebrews to justify a doctrine of losing your salvation which uh, we don't believe. We don't believe that the Bible speaks that way. We believe we are saved by grace. We believe we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Uh, we will talk in chapter 12 about what happens when we don't obey the rules. But again, God is gracious. But we believe that if you are truly saved, you are saved forever. It's called eternal security. But in chapter 6 and in chapter 10 and in many other places, uh, the author contrasts the Old Testament law and the Old Testament lifestyle with New Testament. So although he talks about the severity of God in chapter 2 concerning two or three witnesses, there was condemnation, and then he talks about neglecting so great a salvation, which is us. But the judgment in the first two verses is speaking about the Old Testament. Same thing in chapter 3. It talks about the the waters of Meribah, and how they did not enter into the promise because of unbelief. And then he jumps into chapter 4, and he's talking about us. And he's talking about how we enter into the rest. So you got to be careful. you got to see who is he talking to. Is he talking to the Jews, uh, the Jewish mindset of the Old Testament, or is he talking to the Jews, the New Testament believing Jews? So and because of that, people can look at the points where he's referring to the Old Testament or referring to the law and try to incorporate that into something New Testament wise. So just to make that point again. Uh, now in chapter 12, it begins with the word wherefore. This is another word. You can sit up here. It's all right. You, you're very quiet. You were great. Now, now, now I'm the one that's making the distraction. But, um, I was looking for a big boy pants. I forgot them. Oh, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I had to go back and get them. Yeah, good, good. I mentioned that last time. Um, why does it say wherefore? It says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, last week in chapter 11, we talked about the heroes of faith. These are only Old Testament heroes. The New Testament and the church age is full of heroes. You know, and I, you know, I was... Privileged enough to stand in the in the room where uh, Jan Hus preached. I was privileged to stand in the same room that Martin Luther preached. I was privileged to stand in the same room that Pastor Stevens preached, and many others. Pastor, you know, I, I was thinking last, last Sunday we did communion here, and I thought back of the different churches I've actually done communion with during the time of my uh, my time in Greater Grace. In Budapest, in uh, in France, I think we did it. In, in Montreal, we did it just recently. Uh, of course, in Albania and other places. And just to, that communion of the saints that we celebrate, the oneness that we have in the body and the blood of Christ, that is what keeps us all together. That is where the unity uh, is sourced. It's sourced in Christ. When we do this in remembrance of him, everyone, every Christian on the face of the earth, is doing it in remembrance of him. That is the unity of the universal church, not just the local assembly, but the universal body of Christ. And someday we will all be meeting a lot of people that we've never met before and we'll be able to spend eternity with saints of all over the world. And there are heroes, even now. I mean, I can even think of, and I, you know, I have a real place in my heart for the missionaries of Greater Greats World Outreach. And I think of Pastor Stefan and his... Uh, his ministry in Berlin, Germany, and uh, you know, and so many go on and on of all the great men and women and missionaries uh, in greater grace alone. And plus, and then add on to that, all of the other great missionaries of other missionary organizations and other churches that are faithful to send out people into the into the fields to reap a harvest. So this is what it's saying here. It says, "Whereby we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses." 
That's not just the past, but it is the past. We can think of Abraham, and we can think of David, and we can think of Jonathan and his armor bearer, and these great men of faith, and women of faith like Sarah and Esther and Ruth, and uh, marvel at that and, and be encouraged by that. But we can also see Fatima going to Sierra Leone and, you know, and going out and doing great work there. We can see Pastor Borofsky who spent years in uh, Ukraine and in Budapest and Pastor Handel also. And you can look at these men and women and really be encouraged by their faith and be, and be exhorted. Pastor Stevens used to talk about faith fields. And, you know, it's just, you know, it wasn't a weird, it wasn't a pseudo spirituality or some kind of hyper thing. It was, it was just the, the concept of building up each other, that the faith of one is, is an encouragement and a help for the faith of another, that by their faith, I can look at Pastor Schaller or Pastor Moore and these guys who were up in Plattsburgh University, you know, quit their college, went to Bible college, and became pastors and missionaries. And I can look at them, and I can be encouraged, and my faith can be strengthened because I watch them. And we'll see that in Hebrews chapter 13 when it talks about those who have the rule over you, spiritually speaking, the pastors and the elders and those people. It says their faith follows. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and we'll look at it again, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And look at what happened with, what did, uh, in fact, let's, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14. Maybe you're not familiar with this story, hopefully you are, but uh, the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Jonathan decides he wants to go against the Philistines. And he says in verse 6 here, And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come on, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. That's a great verse. There's no restraint. God can save through few and through many. But what does the armor bearer say? And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn you. Behold, I am with you according to your heart. That's faith fields. That's this warmer bearer saying, I am going to trust your faith. I don't have a lot of faith. If I had my, you know, if I were the one starting the conversation, I would not say something like that. I wouldn't say, let's go over and see if we can, us two people, basically you and me carrying your armor, are going to take on a garrison of Philistines. But he looked at Jonathan and saw his faith, and he said, whatever you say, let's do it. And we can be built up, exhorted, encouraged, motivated by those around us, this great cloud of witnesses that we even have today. You know, we are in a very dark period in the world history. And God needs more people out there. Out there, you know, preaching the gospel, being a light in a dark place and and see what happens. Not to say that we're going to have a huge revival in this world, but that's not really what it's all about. It's about one soul. So, so we have some great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. And he has two things here. And we see this a lot in Hebrew poetry. There's a reason why it says weights and sins. It's not just saying, oh, everything. There is a def definite differentiation between those two words. And weights, in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 4, verses uh, 17 and 18. Jesus is speaking, and he says, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time, and afterward when affliction or persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, as such as hear the word. It's, this is that parable of the sower and the seed. Um, Pastor Moore spoke a little bit about it on Sunday. 
And it can be, you know, when it talks about the seed being the gospel and how some receive it and some in good ground and they bear fruit. Others, the cares of the world choked up, choked it off, and they don't bear fruit. So it can be used even for our sakes. And I, I tell you, I, I can name, and of course I won't, but I can think of many, many people in every one of those categories during the course of, you know, my years as a pastor even, of people who have had the gospel preached to them and Satan just takes it away, they don't receive it. You see that all the time in evangelism, street evangelism, door to door. Um, but then those who had no root, those who spring up, I mean, and you see it. You see people coming to a church. Next, I had a guy tell me after he'd only been in church a couple of weeks that he was going to be the next pastor. He knew that I was, you know, transitioning out, and he came up to me and he said, I'm going to be your next pastor. The guy wasn't even faithful on Sunday mornings. But he said he was going to be the next pastor of the church. Hey, maybe he will. I don't know. God knows that. But, uh, you know, we have people that spring up quickly but no root. And then those that the cares of the world choke them out. And these are weights. These are things that are distractions. Things that anything that gets in the way of God's work in our lives or God's ability to guide us down his path. And, and it could be anything and it could be everything. You know, and all of us are susceptible to some, and it's not just temptations. It can just be the details of life that can distract us to such an extent that we, we become un, unfruitful. And uh, we got to be careful. We got to check ourselves. We got to say, is this a weight? Is this necessary in my life? Is this something that is profitable for the kingdom of God? Or is this a waste of time? You know, I mean, you, how much time can we spend on social media or, you know, things like that nature? It's, it's amazing how much time can be lost. Um, so we have to be careful of the, care, the cares of the word, world here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, um, this is the, it, Paul says that this man named Demas, Pastor Shabelli talks about this poor guy <laughs> all the time, Demas. Verse 10, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Christians to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Dalmatia is actually Croatia. I'd like to go see Dalmatia someday. Yeah. Um, but uh, Demas, and you think, oh, bad guy. You know, Paul didn't, Paul, that's not what Paul said about this guy. In the book of Philemon and in the book of Colossians, Paul is praising this guy as a fellow laborer. Demas was a good guy. But, what does it say here, right? It says he loved this present world. Jesus says you can't, you can't love the world. We are strangers and pilgrims. Remember we said that from the last class. Be careful because there is so much of this world to love. Satan is just loving to give you something to love here in the world. And it can be such a such a detriment to your to your walk. Not to say that you know, because we do, we gotta live in the world, and we can have fun in the world. We can go skiing in the world, and we can, you know, have we can have fun. We can even go to McDonald's if you so choose. I'm not, you know, <laughs> McDonald's is not of Satan, and we're all gonna die. You can die healthy, or you can die happy. <laughs> so. You know, there are, we can enjoy the life God has given us, and we're supposed to have a life of the fullness of joy. He's, asked, he's promised that he would give us uh, an abundant life in John chapter 10, verse 10. Uh, an abundant life doesn't mean the, the glories of this world, but it does mean a, a, a joyful life, a, joy, a life of uh, peace and joy in Christ. So there is definitely a balance, and God gives the blessings that we would not even expect as we focus on his righteousness. Yeah. So poor Demas left Paul, loved the world, but, you know, he's in heaven. He's in heaven. He was a co fellow laborer. This is in Colossians 4.14 and Philemon 24. He speaks very highly of Demas. But now Paul is in prison. Paul's going to die. He's in Mamertine prison. His days are numbered. And everybody was, he was like, Everybody was forsaken him at that point, pretty much. In Galatians chapter 5, 
verses 7 through 9. Paul says to the church there, he says, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion came not from him that called you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, you did run well. What, what hindered you? And that's, you know, that's sad. And, and, and you know, we got to be careful. Now, I'm in, a, I'm in a season right now where I have to be very careful because we really enjoyed our time in Europe uh, these 13 years. And I could get very complacent here. I got a job now. I, you know, I could, I could say, you know, I did my job. I, I was out there. Praise the Lord. Things are great. Now I'm going to... You know, I'm going to retire. Uh, that's not that's not wise. You know, in fact, I got to be careful. I want to get back on the field as soon as I can, uh, by God's grace and in God's perfect will. But um, we can all be that way. We can all do well and then suddenly get cold, get uh, comfortable. We should never be comfortable. That's a bad place to be. Comfort is not for us disciples. Uh, the thrill, the excitement, the, the exhilaration of a walk of faith is better than comfort. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, now I'm just talking about the weights. And they, we all have them. They're not sin, necessarily. Although I, I was going to get the quote. Uh, Wesley's mom, Susanna Wesley, had this great quote about sin. I didn't write it down. In fact, I don't think I have it on my phone either. But it was basically anything, any, even no matter how good it is, anything that does, is not, does not glorify God, is not God's plan for your life, is sin to you. It does say that. I think it's the book of James where it says anything, any, if you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. It says, don't you know that they which run the race run for all, and only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Therefore I so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep my body, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have Preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, you know, it's a long race, but it says here in that, in that passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that we run the race with endurance, right, with patience, because uh, it's a long race. It's a lifetime race. You don't want to start out sprinting because you're going to get tired. You're going to get exhausted. You want to start really by walking. You know, you want, we want to walk by faith. And, and begin to get established in grace. And then as we walk, then we can learn to run. And once we start running, we can run hard after God. And it's a, it's a life run. You know, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a 100-yard dash. And this is why it says here in chapter 12, verse um, 1, that we uh, run with patience the race race that is set before us and I, I mean I hope that that stirs you up that type of a verse that there is a race to be run there is a there is a prize to be got there is a reward to receive these are I mean it's true in second John 8 there is a reward oh yeah but I'm not here for that oh I'm just here to praise the Lord glorify God get the prize you know go for it get the reward do all you know, go get to have it exhausted and say, Whew, that was quite a ride. <laughs> and then God says, well done. You know, let's, we, we're not in it for the glory, but hey, let's glory in it. Mm -hmm. Right? No. That's another t-shirt, I think. You're not in it for the glory, no, let's no. glory in it. No. And sins. We're going to talk about sin. That's why Pat's in the first row. The sins that beset us. The sin. Now, in the Vulgate, the way this is translated is the sin standing around us. I like that. Because there's sin all around us. There's always sin standing around us. 
Satan is always giving us an opportunity to fall. Uh, he's always putting traps around and snares around. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that, uh, that no temptation, you know, that has befallen you is uncommon to, to man. It's all common to man. But God has given a way to escape. But we don't always find that way. In fact, sometimes we see the way to escape and we go the other way anyway. I mean, right? I mean, don't, don't raise your hand. But you know it's true. <laughs> you know that happens sometimes. God gives you a way to escape. And you're like, thank you, God. But I'm going, I'm going, you know, into darkness anyway. In Psalm 1 1, this is, you know, a verse you probably know well. It says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Um, because we've got a race to run, right? We don't want to be walking in the wrong counsel. We don't want to be standing out of the race, talking to sinners. And we don't, certainly don't want to be sitting around. Scornful means mocking uh, or judging and, and just being critical, having a critical spirit. We don't want to be that. That sitting is not going to win a race. In fact, really the only way that we lose the race God has set before us is by not running. That's how we lose. If we run, we win. And it doesn't matter how fast we are, how conditioned we are, how much of the Bible we know really. It's just a matter, are we running? Or are we walk, or are we sitting in the seat of the scornful? Are we turned aside are the weights and the sins in life the sins that are all around us and the weights of the details are they hindering us that we won't run with him are the cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches or anything like that are they choking out our ability to hear from God we want to be careful we want to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us so easily besets us. I mean, that's powerful words. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And I'll tell you, being here tonight, being at the discipleship class on Sunday, being at church on Sunday mornings, you know, these are running with patience. Being part of the body of Christ, fellowshipping. This, this weekend we've got a premier pastor coming to, the, to this church, Pastor John Love. And uh, I would recommend everybody, you know, be here to everything you possibly can. Because it's a great man of God. And uh, his, his messages are really phenomenal. Was he talking on Friday night and Saturday? He is. He'll be here Friday night, yeah, for the first message. Oh, so yeah. how many messages? Oh, three. 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 Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, even Sunday morning. Now, in verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, finisher of our faith. Now, the way the Greek uh, grammar says here, it's looking up and away unto Jesus. Now, when you're running a race, you don't look around. You don't want to look over your shoulder to see who's following you, how close the competition is, right? Because it slows you down. It, it takes you out of your equilibrium. And you don't want to do that. You want to be focused. I was always, when I was learning how to drive, you... You focus not on the road directly in front of you, but you look up, up the road a little ways, even to the horizon, and using your peripherals to see the whole road. Uh, when, you're look, when you're guiding a boat, you look to the horizon for a point that is steadfast that you go towards, so that if there's a current, you can make sure you stay the right course. So with our walk of faith, it says here to look up and away, up from the, the horizontal, the things of this world, but look up to Christ in a way and always stay focused on him as we run. He is the author and finisher. He is the source and completer of our faith. And he is the one that has mapped out our course. He's the one that is actually cheering us on and giving us all the ability we need for the race by his spirit. You know, the word dunamis means ability, and it's translated power in the, in the Greek New Testament over and over again. So when you see the power of God, it's the ability of God. 
and it's the Holy Spirit. We get, we don't want to spend, uh, we don't want to give ourselves too much credit. And, you know, we need, we shouldn't give ourselves any credit. We should just be thankful that he has called us into the ministry, as Paul says. You know, because he will enable us for exactly what he has for us. And then we know that we are the earthen vessel. He is the treasure within. And we get, and he is the one that's glorified, not us. We don't, that, that glory, is a, glory is a fleeting thing. You see it in entertainment. You know, all these award shows and these, you know, accolades that these singers and actors get. It's, it's, it's so fake. It's not real. That's not what we want. We don't want that kind of glory. No, we just want to be, we just want to run hard after the one that loves us. We want to, we want to find the lover of our soul and we want to run to him. As it says in Song of Songs. Right? That's, that's what we want to do. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, pressing towards that calling. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, it says, I have set my face like a flint. I mentioned this, I think, in a message recently. That terminology, you set my face like a flint, means I set my face like the point of an arrow. The flint was the, the stone used to making arrowheads. So when he says that, what he's saying is, I have set my face like the point of an arrow. That that's where I'm going. Right? You fire an arrow, it goes in one direction. And, and it, you know, it's got that aerodynamics of that arrowhead, and it goes to the target. That's what we need to do. We need to set our face like a flint. Really understanding the reality of our faith, right? In Hebrews 11.1, 1. it is the it is the the fact it is the you know that we are absolutely certain of the things we don't see, that we say as fact those things that our senses cannot understand or can can grab onto, but I believe it, and we have to have that kind of a belief. We really need to just have that belief in God. He is. He is who He said He is. He is. Who, he will do what He said He will do, and I will trust Him for my life. And if we do that, you know, then He finds Himself faithful, even in our unfaithfulness. I mean, this is what's remarkable, remarkable about our God. Yeah. Even in our unfaithfulness, He abides faithful. Yeah. Even if we deny Him, He abides faithful. He can't deny Himself. Yeah. You know. And we have found this one. We have found this gracious God that calls us children and calls us friends, calls us brethren. Not even ashamed to call us brethren. That's amazing. Yeah. In Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Again, I studied for this class two days ago. So some of my notes are like, what? What, are, what is Luke 9, 51? Oh. This is Jesus. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be re received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, what did that mean? What was waiting for him in Jerusalem? Yeah, the crucifixion. But he said, you know what? That's it. That's the goal. That's the teleos. And then he would even use that that phraseology really in on the cross in John 19:30. It is finished to telestai. means paid in full, complete. The finished work, as we call it. Uh, he knew I'm going to be crucified. And he didn't, you know, Peter would say, hey, don't do it, don't go. But uh, Jesus knew that's what I'm here for, and that's what I'm doing. That word for looking up in the Greek is aphroeo, A-P-H-O-R-A-O. And it means to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something else. This is uh, aphroeo, A-P-H-O-R-A-O. Looking up in a way unto Jesus to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something else. 
And that's it. That's what we do. Um, so it, continuing on in verse 3, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, just I just want to backtrack a little bit. I don't know why I didn't put more on here for verse 2, which says, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him. Of course, it was the redemption of our souls. We are the joy that was set before him. But there is also a joy set before us as we walk by faith. And we don't know our end. You know, we could, we could be coming into an age where Christians are persecuted more in this country than they have, than they have been in many, maybe ever, I mean, in this country. Uh, there are Christians who are persecuted in other countries today. To understand that this is the life we're going to be living uh, from this point on if the Lord tarries much longer uh, it's not going to be the days I mean we can most of us here as I look around we can remember the days when this was a judeo-christian country and it was a moral country and it was a good country and it was you know apple pie and you know Chevrolet or whatever you know I mean it was a good place to be and we're and it's shocking for us to see what has happened to this country and what is being uh, being done to it. It's, it's, it's sad and it's shocking. It's not surprising and it's part of the whole end time scenario, but uh, it is sad. But right now, it, it means that we are called to war. You know, we are called to arm. We're not called to go to Cuomo's office and, you know, <laughs> slap him in the head and stuff like that. Oh, it's not what we're called to. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're called to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be right by, I'll be cheering for you. <laughs> I know hearing more church pastors speak up and speak well, to them. Well, but, but we're here for souls. That's what we're here for. What if this guy... His name, it's not Mario Cuomo, it's a different Cuomo, right? Andrew. Andrew, Andrew Cuomo. I'm sorry, I'm not from around here. No <laughs> worries. That's, that's no no worries. No worries. Mario. Yeah. Uh, no worries. The king. The guy yeah, needs to get saved. Yeah, he does. The guy needs to get saved. He needs somebody to come up to him and give him the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you know, that's the thing. We are, we're not here to change governments. You know, otherwise, I can take you to Albania. You, know, you know, you can talk to Eddie Rama. You know, Eddie Rama, he's the prime minister of Albania, and he's got a lot of problems. He could, he, you know, he deserves a couple of slaps in the head himself. <laughs> but that's not why we were there. And every country has its problems, and every country has its demons. And the world system is controlled by Satan. We are here to be the light unto a dark age and dark world. We are the ones to preach the gospel to the people that are opposing themselves and opposing Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. We are the fishers of men, like Pastor Moore was saying Sunday morning. So be careful. We don't want to. We don't want to be throwing stuff at the television every night. You know, <laughs> we just we want to be out there on a Saturday afternoon and doing some evangelism or whatever, or talking to the people in the grocery stores and neighbors and let them know that there is a Savior and yeah. that they need Him. Yeah. So. Um, the joy set before him was us. The joy set before us is him. You know, we are we are now his laborers. We are his workmen uh, in 1 Corinthians 3. And uh, let's joy in that. Let's joy in that labor of love and uh, bringing the gospel and see what happens. Do it with joy. And, uh, and know that it's all going to end well for us, right? It's right. going to end very well for us. Right. I don't know how it's going to end for us on this lifetime, but eternity looks pretty good. Yeah. And our names are written in that book. Yeah. So, you know, let's just finish out this course by faith, because up there there's not going to be any need for that faith stuff. They're not going to be preaching faith in heaven, because we are going to see him with our eyes we will see him 
Our Redeemer lives, and you will see him. Amen. It says that Jesus endured the cross. Um, and then in verse 3, it says that he endured the contradiction of sinners. The word endured is hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O, -E and it means to remain under. It, it, mean, it really, sometimes it's uh, translated patience, to stay under in a trial, to be patient. Um, he remained under, he took the cross, and everything it meant, it meant the public humiliation, it meant the beating and the scourging and the pain and the suffering, it meant death on that cross. He took everything. He endured everything. In Philippians chapter uh, 2, verses um, 5 through 7, I believe it is, the self-emptying of Christ, that Christ would um, be our sacrifice. And then he endured the sinners, the contradiction of sinners against himself. And he says here, don't be weary and faint in your minds. And you know, we will have the contradiction of sinners. I mean, what happens when you say you're a Christian today? It's not the same as it was if you said you were a Christian in 1970. Right? They say that if you have a panel, a panel discussion on a television show, and you have a professor, and you have a doctor, and you have a pastor, the pastor will be the least believed because they will consider him the most intolerant. He will be the one that will not speak... Well, intelligently, he will just speak dogmatically about his belief systems. Uh, and it's sad because that's it's so true that if a pastor were to say something, people would just blow it off like, ah, he's one of those holier than thou, those Bible thumpers um, who believe in this horrible God that they've, you know, they've turned, turned God into, a, into an evil thing. In Romans chapter 1, we see that happening. So we need to endure also. Jesus endured the cross. We need to endure a personal cross. We need to have a personal cross. We need to deny ourselves. Ourselves would love to rule our lives. But God says, no, deny yourself. Die daily and take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. You know, it is, it is a difficult decision that we must make every day and even more than once a day because we can oftentimes forget what we said in the morning <laughs> but if, as Jesus endured the cross we need to endure a personal cross another thing we see here when it talks about the contradiction of sinners that word for contradiction is antilogia a-n-t-i-l-o-g-i-a -A. for those of for those Greek scholars in the room you know what that means against the word. Logia, logos, is the word. Anti, as with antichrist and other antis, it means against. Uh, against the word. The contradiction of sinners against the word. And I, I mean, in evangelism, you see this all the time. You see them coming against the word. And Jesus took that on himself. And I mean, can you imagine this? The word, right? In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Logos. And they are, they are coming against him and against the Word, against everything he is. Everything about his essence, the world was against. Imagine the spiritual warfare that was happening on that day at that cross. Pastor Stevens wrote a doctrine book called The Greatest Battle Ever Fought. Uh, I recommend it. It's a very powerful book concerning the, the spiritual warfare at the crucifixion of Christ. But he took it. He took the contradiction, the antilogia, the, those against the word, those against the cross, those against the Savior. And for us, we have to endure also. And we have to have a personal cross. And we have to have a personal Bible. We have to read. Many pastors, when I talk to them, they say, you know, I don't know how many people in my church really read their Bible. And I don't know how many. Are. And I had, I used, I realized that early on in Albania too. Because, I mean, we had some great, great people. I mean, they're wonderful people. But uh, you couldn't just say, oh, Jonathan and his armor bearer. As I said tonight, you guys probably were like, oh yeah, I know that story. And there, you have to turn there. 
You got to read the scripture because they're not going to, they don't know it. They never read that. They don't know who Jonathan is. They don't know what an armor bearer is. So you have to actually go back and he, spoon feed. And we all have to be spoon fed from time to time. And that's really what uh, the benefit we have when we come to church on Sundays is we have a pastor who is studied and is going to spoon feed us a good message for us to eat. But at the same time, we need to get into some meat on our own. We need to get our own Bible. We have to need to have our own devotions. And we need to read this book. I know it's a long book. I've read it a couple of times over the years. And I tell you, it's a good read. It's exciting. <laughs> it's got some really, I mean, the Old Testament is full of some really exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, it's a great book. It's alive. And it teaches us. Amen. So we need to have, you know, as Jesus endured the cross and the contradiction of sinners, we need to endure. We need to have a personal cross and we need to have a personal Bible in our lives. That, uh, and this is, you know, it's, it's, it profits us. This is not, you know, this is not uh, like, uh, you know, trying to tell you to eat your broccoli or something. I'm telling you, this is a good thing. I love broccoli is a good thing, too. But anyway, this is better than broccoli. Yeah. We can quote that. Bible is better than broccoli. It's not going to be on the test. It says we don't want to be weary and faint. Weary means tired and faint. The word ekluo means uninterested. We don't want to be weary. We don't, we don't want to get tired in the race, right? You want to have your second wind and your third wind and your fourth wind because uh, it's a long race. And you want to pace yourself. Run with patience. The race set before you. You don't want to get weary. You don't want to get tired. And you certainly don't want to become uninterested. I've never written, uh, run a marathon, and I'm pretty sure I never will. <laughs> I'm hoping I never will, uh, because I would be very uninterested. It's 26 miles plus, and I'm sure I would be very uninterested in this race after about 20 feet. <laughs> so be careful, because you can get uninterested. You can start looking around, and uh, like Demas did, begin to love the world. These things can happen to any one of us. You know, we need to be careful. Keep our eyes focused, having our personal cross, our personal Bible, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, verse 4 is a transition verse. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Because now he's going to tar start talking about the consequences of sin. And uh, we're going to talk about that. Oof, wow. I must have been just a little chatty today. Right? <laughs> okay, that's okay. We're going to get through this. Um, verse 4, he says, You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. And this is where I wanted to speak a little bit about um, the book itself, Hebrews. This is the, in the verse um, 2, is the first time you see the word cross in this book. This is really an Old Testament commentary. Remember we talked about that. It's about the Pentateuch. And it's teaching Jewish believers about this Messiah, this Jesus. And using a lot of Old Testament passages to do that. But at this point, he transitions into the believer only. He doesn't... And, and this is why I was saying that you got to be careful when you're reading things like chapter 3 about the waters of Meribah. And how God, they died in the wilderness. When you look at verse chapter 2, when it talks about being uh, condemned under two or three witnesses. These are Old Testament passages. He's using them as a parallel. Remember, he even uses the word parable, setting side by side. And when it looks at chapter 6, and it talks about uh, no, there is no way of renewing them unto repentance seeing they crucified Christ afresh, it's speaking of how you, there were no more sacrifices. The one sacrifice was the only sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 10, when it talks about the severity of God, what he was saying is, look at how severe God was in the Old Testament. Hello, it's the same God, but you're a new, you're a new creature. It is a new dispensation, but just kind of just remember what happened then. And then to walk with God, even with fear and trembling. To, to not lose uh, 
our, our, our sight as to who God is, how holy he is. Mm. He is God on the throne. He is not to be mocked. He's not to be played with. He is not to be ignored or, or thought of as a small thing. He is God, and he always will be. So here he's saying now, you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And now he's going to talk about sin. And um, I'm going to see as far as I can get on this. Maybe we can get it all the way through, but we'll see. Um, verse 5, he says, but, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. You know, it is a good thing to be rebuked by God. You know, it is a profitable thing for us, for God to say, hey, that's wrong. Let's, you know, let's not go that way. Let's go this way. You know, people, you know, there are so those who do who, uh, respond well to uh, negative reinforcement. Not everybody does. Most people don't. But, uh, and God isn't that way really so much, but... To be rebuked. Can you receive rebuke? You know, when you think of people who leave churches, oftentimes, you know, it's because they didn't like what they heard from the pulpit. And it's not, you know, and we're going to talk about this in chapter 13. A couple of times it talks about those who have rule over you. In fact, three times it says, talks about those who have rule over you. And it's talking about spiritual leaders. It's talking about pastors. Um, you love the grace message. You love the happy messages. You finished work messages. You are you are wonderful. You are complete and great. And these are real. These are true. Absolutely. But there are going to come times when pastor's got to open his Bible. He's got to turn to Hebrews 12. Or he's got to turn to a passage. And he's got to say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get very clear on some issues here. And why? It's for our benefit. Right? We got to know the, the good from the evil. We got to know how to separate these things. We got to be encouraged in a holy walk because God is holy. And so people leave churches because they don't want to hear the hard message. They don't want to hear the tough messages. Uh, that's unfortunate. We have to be willing to take, you know, what did it say? Uh, the Proverbs about, uh, is that where it talks about sparing the rod? Okay. I don't know if that's in Proverbs or not. I mean, maybe got the king really saying. Probably is not. <laughs> probably even better. I don't know. Yeah, it is um, but we need to, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Proverbs there, and it's true. You need to have friends. You need to have Nathans in your life. Mm -hmm. David was very grateful to have Nathan. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. When G David sinned with Bathsheba, he went nine months of. Uh, of, of deep depression and uh, Nathan came to him and he, you know, he gave, told him this story and then Dave, and Nathan said you're the man, you're the one that took another man's wife and uh, rebuked him soundly and he was restored through it he didn't say that. Yeah, I think a wise man loves rebuke but a fool despises it yep, yep yeah, yeah, become, you know, learn to love the correction of the Lord and thank him for it. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to how uh, the steps of God's chastening. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it talks about uh, instructing children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This word for chastening in the Greek, the word is pegeo. I have a whiteboard. I might go do that. <laughs> In <laughs> uh, actual, the word here means uh, it comes from the root word pace, which means child. And that's it. And so it's it's talking about instructing. And you know, many of us here are parents. We know how it works, right? We love our children dearly, but we love them enough to correct them. We don't want little Johnny running out in the traffic. And he may need to be spanked, God forbid, in the 21st century. 
He may need to be disciplined so that he won't run into traffic. Why? Because you love your child and you don't want him hurt. God forbid you don't want him killed. And you do what you have to to raise up your children in love with grace but have to have instruction. So the chastening of the Lord doesn't necessarily mean that he's putting you over his knee. That's not really what chastening is talking about in the early stages. It's talking about instructing children, raising children. Paul would say in Galatians 4, I believe it's 19, he says, I travail at birth till Christ be formed in you. He's talking about the process of growth of a child. And that's every one of us. He calls us little children. He said that in John 21, when the guys came off the boat. Little children, do you have any need? <laughs> Jesus is a funny guy. He's got a sense of humor. <laughs> he knew they didn't have any Because he's pushing the fish to the other side of the lake all night. While they're, he's got angels under the water just, you know, keeping the fish out of the net. He knew they didn't have but he loves them, but he corrected them that day too, right? Even even Peter had to have a discussion, had to go talk to dad for a little bit. <laughs> Peter did in John chapter 21. But that's what this word for chastisement means. It's got to do with raising children. And that's us. And we want to be, you know, we want to hear from our father. We want to hear what he has to say. And we want to respond to him. The first step in God's chastening is grace. That's it. It's grace. And if we will hear from God and receive the grace for the situation, everything else is fine. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 speaks on this. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Um, it's grace. He gives us grace. The Holy Spirit is always speaking to us. We have to hear from him through the word of God, through the pulpit, through our prayer life, through our meditations. Hear the Holy Spirit's talking to us. It's not an audible voice. I've never had an audible, God's never spoken, this is my son. Well, please, you would never say that to me, but uh, he's not, I've never heard God speak to me audibly. It's not necessary. I hear him. I know what he's saying. I know his, his word. His word is truth. Um, but in Titus 2, 11 and 12, he says that uh, his grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. In Romans 2, 4, 2, 4, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Leads us to repentance. The goodness of God. The grace of God. Romans 5, 20 and 21 says, Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And if we receive the grace, we stop the sin. You see? Receive the grace of God. Receive the teaching of, of His grace. Receive the goodness that leads us to repentance and repent. It's so simple, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's easy, God. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna stop here for a little while, only because I think the clock on the wall says same clock. So we'll <laughs> take a small break and we'll talk the rest of chapter twelve, and we will do chapter thirteen this evening. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.